and welcome to this webinar about the basics of photography. I'm Angela Nicholson and I'm the founder of She Clicks and tonight I'm going to be talking about shutter speed. I'm going to start by sharing my screen. So before we get started, uh, let's just have a word from our sponsor. Now, this webinar and the whole series of the basics of photography is sponsored by Fujifilm. And they have a great scheme that allows you to hire a camera or lens or both uh, for two days, completely free, including delivery. So if you're thinking that you'd love to try the GFX 100S or perhaps um, you're, you've got an inkling to try the XS10 or something like that, or maybe the XE4, the brand new uh, little camera, or perhaps an exotic lens, you could try it completely free for 48 hours. If you want to extend the loan, you can pay for that. But if you then decide that you'd like to buy that camera or lens, you get a refund on your, um, your loan fees. Um, so why not check it out if you're interested in a Fuji camera or lens? You just need to go to fujifilm-loan.com and then you can see what dates, um, which kit is available and work out that some, something that works for you. So thank you very much to Fujifilm for sponsoring this webinar. So let's start with a quick recap of uh, some ground that we've covered before. Now, you may remember there are several connected elements when we're talking about exposure, and it's really hard to explain or, or understand them in isolation because they're all kind of linked and connected. Um, but it's you've got to sort of jump in somewhere and mark, make a mark in the sand and, and start having a go on getting your head around the various concepts. So tonight we're talking about shutter speed. Last time we spoke about aperture and the time before that we were talking about exposure in general. So if you remember, I said uh, previously that the numbers are strange. Now, I think they are a little bit more understandable um, for shutter speed because we're talking about fractions and whole numbers and they kind of mathematically make sense. Whereas with aperture, it's a bit more of a head scratch because, you know, there's a there's a weird equation involved and the numbers don't necessarily make that much sense to you when you're first starting out. But, um, you know, you still have some odd numbers to get used to. So don't worry if you don't understand it first time around. It's not you. that Everybody is like this. Nobody is born with an eight understanding of photography and exposure. It's something you have to learn and it's something that you need to have explained. And it might be that you need several people to explain it because everybody uses it in a different way of explaining and make and eventually it adds up and it makes it clear. I certainly didn't understand photography and exposure the first few times it was explained to me. And like many people, I was tempted to go to the auto uh, mode on the dial, on the exposure dial. And that can be great because, you know, nine times out of ten, you'll probably get a, a really decent result. But the thing is, you don't get your interpretation of the scene. And that is why you have to start taking control of thing like, things like shutter speed and aperture. So stick with it. Um, you know, by all means, you can watch the previous webinars. You can watch this one again and you can watch future webinars, but don't miss the future webinars. So a little recap on what is exposure. Well, it's the amount of light that you need to make an image. Now, we often think about exposure as the brightness of the image, but actually the brightness of the image is a feature of the exposure. And the exposure is controlled by the amount of time that the shutter is open, also known as shutter speed, the size of the aperture and the sensitivity or ISO of the film or sensor. This webinar is about shutter speed, we'll cover ISO in the next one, and then in the final of this series, the fifth one, we'll pull everything together and hopefully it'll all start to make sense and you'll be able to sort of really piece everything together. So what is shutter speed? Well, as I've already said, it's um, also known as exposure time and it's the amount of time that the shutter is open to let light in to reach the sensor of fi or, or film. The longer the shutter is open, the greater the amount of light that can reach the sensor. Now, you remember if you saw the um, aperture webinar, I was talking about aperture being a bit like a hose pipe that, uh, you know, the light comes through or the water goes through the hose pipe. And you have a big fat hose pipe, you'll get a lot more water um, more quickly and you'll fill up the bucket quickly. And if you have a small aperture or a small bore um, hose pipe, you'll only get um, a little trickle of water coming out and it'll take a long time to fill the bucket. And shutter speed is the tap, really. It's um, if you turn the tap on quickly and then turn it off really quickly, you just get a little bit of, of water coming through. But if you open it up 
and leave it open, leave it running for a while, you know, you'll, you'll fill up the bucket and you get lots of light or lots of water coming through. So if you think of shutter speed as the amount of time that the tap is open or closed, um, that should help you sort of understand shutter speed really and how it links with aperture. Now mechanical shutter is governed by the speed of the timing, sorry, is governed by the timing of the opening and closing of two blinds inside the camera. Now a lot of people are surprised that it's two blinds often or two curtains, people often think it's just one. But if you think about it, as the shutter um, opens and then closes, if it was just one curtain coming down to open and up to close, then the top bit of the sensor is going to be exposed for a lot longer than the bottom one because of the bottom of it, because obviously as the shutter comes back up, you know, this, this bit is exposed for quite a lot longer. And then, you know, the, the top, so the top bit is exposed for a lot longer. So you'd get like a, a graduation effect on your image it would be a lot lighter at the top than it would be at the bottom. So instead what happens is this opens and then another shutter comes down to close it. And that's quite a clever, clever um, solution. And it's, it's quite a simple solution in many respects. And you could think about it a bit like if you had um, two curtains in your living room across the window and they're both big enough to cover the whole window. So you close the curtains, close one curtain right the way across the window then you can open it up that way and then you can close it with the other one. It's exactly the same sort of thing. Now, there are times, of course, when the shutter speed or the exposure is so brief that you need the second curtain to be closing before the first one has actually got to the other end. And that's when you get the shut. This one starts to open and this one starts to close and they kind of pass down and you just get a narrow band of light moving down the sensor. And you could recreate that in your living room just by opening the curtain, but then closing the other one at the same speed and you go along and you'd have a narrow band of light moving across your window. And if someone was sat in the room, they would probably see, they should see that the amount of light sort of bouncing around the room at that time is constant, should stay about the same. So that's why you have two curtains with the mechanical shutter. But increasingly, there's uh, cameras have an electronic shutter, and this is a feature really of digital photography, um, and it's particularly prevalent with mirrorless cameras. And the electronic shutter is basically, um, it's uh, you get a very quick readout from the sensor. It's almost like turning the sensor on and off again, just for a very short duration or whatever exposure time you need. Um, and there are pros and cons to using both shutter, to, to, to using either shutter. Um, the mechanical one is the traditional one, uh, and so the electronic one is, is the more modern one. And some cameras you can use either. You can set the camera to auto shutter and it will select which one is appropriate. So how is shutter speed measured? Well, it's measured in seconds, usually in fractions of a second and sometimes in whole seconds and occasionally, but particularly with bulb mode, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, you might be measuring it in minutes. So cameras have a maximum and a minimum shutter speed or exposure time. And it's often something in the region of 30 seconds to something like one four thousandth of a second. It might be faster. Some cameras, it might be a little bit slower. And then there's something called bulb mode, which I just mentioned. And that is um, in, in bulb mode. When you press the shutter release down, if you keep your finger on it, the shutter stays open for the entire time that your finger is there and you actually, you know, you have to use your watch or whatever to time how long you want the exposure. Of course, putting your finger on the button isn't the most sensible thing to do because you'll make the camera wobble. But what you can do is you can use a remote release. You can open the shutter and you can lock it open and then you just walk around. You know, you can time your exposure and then you close it all off. So that's bulb mode. Um, and with electronic shutters, sometimes the exposure can go up to something like um, 32 thousandth of a second. And obviously, you know, that's an incredibly fast um, shutter speed, which could be really useful for uh, freezing split second moments, uh, you know, something like water splashes or something like that. It can be helpful to go beyond 4000 if you've got a really wide aperture lens and you want to shoot with it wide open and it's bright, sunny conditions, something like that. Sometimes you need to go for faster exposure times. So let's think about now how we adjust shutter speed. And you may remember, this might ring a bell from aperture 
um, the, the aperture webinar because halving the shutter speed increases the amount of light reaching the sensor by two times. So if you think about it, if you're switching from a 60th of a second to a 30th of a second, you are um, doubling the amount of light, sorry, you are doubling the amount of time that the shutter is open. So we talk about halving the shutter speed. It's, it's a bit confusing when we talk about halving speed and um, ex extending exposure time. But by going from a 60th of a second to a 30th of a second, you're doubling the amount of time that the shutter is open. And therefore, you are doubling the amount of light that is reaching the sensor or the film. So conversely, doubling the shutter speed or decreasing the exposure time decreases the amount of light by half. So switching from a 30th of a second to a 60th of a second, you're decreasing the amount of light by a half. So it's always a factor of two that we're thinking about when we're moving in in whole stops. So look, this, this might kind of ring a few bells from the aperture um, webinar, because if we look at this scale, which is running from one second to one two thousandth of a second, what I've done there was I've marked off all what we call the whole stop, um, exposure, sorry, shutter speed settings. And so we go from one second to half a second to a quarter to an eighth to a fifteenth to a thirtieth and to a sixtieth. Now, when we go from say an eighth to a fifteenth, I think we we kind of um, we do that because the maths is easier. Um, we could, you know, theoretically we should go to a sixteenth, but it it makes so little difference. It's not really a problem. And going from a sixtieth to a one twenty fifth, um, it's the same sort of thing. So we're talking about halving and doubling. Um, the amount of light by halving and doubling the exposure time. Now, as, as usual, as you might remember from ap the Aperture webinar, there are marker points, there are settings in between these whole stops. And you can usually um, change it to half stops if you want, but in the um, default settings, most cameras, you adjust in one third st stop steps. So when people sometimes think they're adjusting uh, in one step or sorry, one stop or one EV, actually often they're only adjusting by one third. You need to click three times to adjust by a whole stop. But basically think about things like going from one, a 30th to a 60th to one, two, five. You're increasing the shutter speed in whole stops. So why do you adjust the shutter speed? Well, the first point is that you want to control exposure. It's a way that you can decide whether to make the image brighter or darker. And it's also, and this is the, the real reason why you would want to maybe control shutter speed rather than aperture or as well as aperture, is because you want to control how movement is recorded, whether you want it to be sharp or blurred. And the amount of movement that occurs when the shutter is open determines if the subject is sharp or blurred. Now, if you think about this, if the shutter is open and you have a really fast moving subject in, if it's that, that can move from one side of the, um, the sensor to the other in a 60th of a second, well, that subject is going to be a streak. But if your subject's kind of ambling along and it barely moves in a 60th of a second, then it will be pretty sharp. And it's kind of, it's, about understanding the relationship between the speed of subject and the shutter speed, which is the important thing about uh, taking control of shutter speed. So obviously with a landscape, unless it's a really windy day and all the trees are blowing and the leaves are around, generally speaking, you know, landscapes don't move that much. So you can get away with a slow shutter speed. Generally speaking, a fast shutter speed or a short exposure freezes movement. And a slow shutter speed or a long exposure blurs movement. And when we start talking, we used to talk about slow shutter speeds as being like a 30th or a 50th, 15th of a second. But increasingly, people like to use really long exposures of several seconds, even a minute, something like that, to get um, blurred water, you know, so it looks all sm smooth and silky, or maybe several minutes when um, to record the movement of clouds as a blur. And that can be really dramatic with a landscape because the landscape looks st completely still but you've got blurred clouds above it, and that's done through long exposures. But something to bear in mind is that if the camera moves during a long exposure, the subject will be blurred. Indeed, the whole image will be blurred. So this is where it's important to understand at what shutter speed you can actually handhold your camera and at what point you have to put it on a tripod. And I'll talk about this a bit more later on. 
So now taking control of shutter speed. Well, you may remember that shutter priority mode lets you set the shutter speed while the camera takes care of the aperture. And that's a really useful mode. Um, I tend to use it if I was shooting sports um, because I know that I can set the shutter speed that will um, say if I want to freeze the, foot, uh, the football players, I can set a shutter speed that I'm happy will freeze them and I can let the camera take control of the aperture. Similarly, you know, if I want a little bit of blur, then I can put in an appropriate shutter speed and the camera again will take control of the aperture. There's no need to worry about um, take, you know, controlling both sides of um, the exposure equation. Manual exposure mode lets you set both the shutter speed and the aperture settings. And actually, um, professional uh, photographers, sorry, professional sports photographers often use uh, manual exposure because what they want to do is they might want to put the focus on the subject and they, and they want to use a wide aperture so that, um, say, all the advertising hoardings in the background are blurred. And that's a really useful feature. And one of the nice things about some cameras is you can now use manual exposure mode with, um, uh, with auto sensitivity. So you can set the controls that you want to get exactly the depth of field you want and exactly the degree of blur or sharpness that you want from the, from the shutter speed, but the camera will adjust the sensitivity accordingly. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I'll be talking about that in a future webinar. So on most cameras, you set the shutter speed um, using a command dial and you look on the back of the camera or in the viewfinder or sometimes there's a little screen on top of the camera and you see the shutter speed and you just rotate the dial or maybe it's the front dial and you change the settings. But some cameras um, such as the Fuji XT series, XT4, XT3, that has a shutter speed dial. So if it's got that, then by all means, you know, that use that to set the shutter speed. And that's what that dial looks like. Uh, this image has been a bit blown a bit too far, a bit too big for the uh, resolution, I think. But you can see there that there are whole stop settings and you just rotate the dial. So at the moment it's set to a 60th, but if I rotated it uh, clockwise, it would be um, a 30th, it would get slower. And if I rotated it the other way, then um, it will be a faster shutter speed. And actually, with this, um, you set these whole stop shutter speeds using that dial, but you can get the, the in-between shutter speeds using a command dial, if you like. So this is the back of a camera showing this. This is a typical display. And you, as I say, you would, could see this in the viewfinder or you might see this on the screen. And this is the screen in this instance. So this camera has been set to uh, manual exposure. And you can see that where it says SS, that's shutter speed, that's at one to 125th of a second. And they basically, the cameras just use um, short, shorthand for 125th, uh, sorry, at 125th of a second, because obviously squeezing in that extra one slash takes up a bit more space and it'd be harder to read and it will get a bit cramped. So they just use the one to fifth. And usually you see an apostrophe or quotation mark when it's gone beyond a whole second. So rather than sort of putting the word second or whatever, it, it just said there's an apostrophe or quotation marks. So this camera is set to 125th of a second at f8 and the sensitivity or ISO is 1600. So it wouldn't be a back to basics uh, webinar without Otto appearing. So I've got a series of images now to show the impact of different shutter speeds. So this is shot at a 30th a second. Now, as you can see, Otto is running towards me with a ball that he's just run to get, and he's bringing it back. 30th of a second, it's quite clear. You get a real sense of his kind of rocking horse motion as he's running along because his face is streaked up and down, his paws are streaked and his chest is streaked up and down. And actually, he's completely blurred. If you look at the grass, actually, under his body, it's quite sharp. It's not too bad at all. Um, I'm, I'm kind of moving the, the camera to keep up with him. And so there's a little, you'd expect a little bit of blur, but it's reasonably sharp. It's his movement that's primarily causing that blur. Now at the 60th of a second, we've got a similar situation. There's a bit more, he's kind of moving more diagonally at the moment. So there's a bit more movement of the camera, but although he's clearer, he's still completely blurred. So now at 125th, so I've, I've um, doubled the shutter speed and you can see he's actually pretty sharp. But if you look, he's not super sharp, but he's actually pretty sharp. But if you look at his ears, imagine as he's running, his ears flap around quite a bit. They flap at a faster speed than the rest of him runs. So the tips of his ears are a bit um, soft and you can see his, uh, his right paw 
uh, the one that the front paw that's slightly back, you can see a bit of movement in that as well because it's obviously just going down. 100, sorry, at uh, 2 50th of a second, he looks pretty sharp. Um, this isn't bad at all. Again, I, can, I think I can see a little bit of movement in his front paws. Uh, one of his ears looks a little bit soft. And if you look at the tag, the red tag that he's wearing, you can just see a little bit of blur in that. I mean, it's, I'd have to zoom in for you to see it properly, but there's, there is a little bit of blur. It's just a little bit soft. And this is something that you'll see in um, sports matches. Like I used to, haven't done it for a long time for, for obvious reasons, but if you photograph something like hockey, you can set a shutter speed where the person, the, the, the body of the athlete is quite sharp, but actually because they're swinging their stick, the, the stick and particularly the tip of it is actually quite blurred. And if you get the right shutter speed, you can get a real kind of sense of movement. It's quite interesting. And those balls, when they hit the balls, they really fly. So it's very rare that you get a round hockey ball. You often see, you know, it's, it's a streak. So, um, you know, you can play around with this. It doesn't have to be that everything is super sharp. You can use uh, shutter speed to be more creative, if you like. Now, moving up to 500th of a second, you can see here that Otto is a lot sharper. Um, his tag, again, is a little bit blurred. blurred. You can see it's in sort of it's swinging. It's not so blurred that you've got a trail. It just doesn't look quite sharp enough. And now at a thousandth of a second, you can see how happy he is. He's completely sharp. Um, you can see that, you know, the focus is on him and he's nice and frozen mid bound. Now, this is an alternative way of controlling shutter speed. Um, what I've done here, this is yesterday um, in much nicer, sunnier conditions. So it's, it's towards the end of the day. So we've got that warm sort of golden light, which is why the color changed so dramatically. But he's actually he's running for the ball here and he's always he always runs faster for the ball than he brings it back so he's really shifting here and at an 80th of a second I've panned with him and the aim is I was trying to keep the focus point on him as he runs and by doing that I've got managed to get his face sharp and you get a sense of movement and blur in the background and you remember I was saying about bits of him that are moving faster if you look at his front paws you can't actually distinguish two separate paws because they're moving so quickly um, he's you know that they are quite blurred and you know it's, it's a great fun technique to play around with and, and people who are really good at this you know they, they can get quite um, longer they can use much longer shutter speed, you know, you may be going down to a 15th of a second or something, because the, the longer the, the exposure, obviously, the more blur that you get in the background. I quite like this degree of blur because it's uh, in this instance, you know, you've got a sense of movement. You've got streaks of color rather than a uniform tone. If you were shooting cars and I've, I've been lucky enough to, to photograph at Le Mans at the, um, in the vintage car rally, that's great. You know, you can shoot at 15th of a second, 30th of a second. And that's actually easier than shooting a dog because mostly the, the track is quite smooth, the, the cars move at a constant speed. So you just need to try and sort of position your, it in the frame and keep it at the right point. And you can shoot away, um, taking lots of shots, but you don't get, the problem with Otto, you get the bobbing up and down of the head. You don't get that with a car. So it's easier to get that sense of movement and you get the car frozen, um, sort of looking you know looking nice and sharp but the background's blurred but what the nice trick is to find the balance so that the wheels are actually slightly blurred so again you get that sense of movement in the car as well even though it's sharp so it's a real fun technique to play with okay so i mentioned earlier about shutter speeds um you know being important to consideration when you're hand holding uh, your camera and you need to understand what sort of shutter speed you can use uh, safely without needing a tripod. And there's an old um, guide, which is basically you divide one second by the lenses. It used to be focal length, but now we say effective focal length because there's a, it has an impact. Uh, the, set, the sensor size and the focal length magnification factor has an impact. So here's an example. If we have a hundred millimeter lens on a full frame camera, you want to shoot at at least one hundredth of a second. That should ensure that you get sharp images, provided that your subject isn't moving. So, I mean, obviously you still have to try and stand still and hold the camera steady. This isn't a guide for, you know, you can wobble your camera around and not really concentrate. You have to hold, you know, go through all the processes that you would normally um, of, of, you know, bracing the, the camera, holding it um, nice and steady, as steady as you can. But 
about a hundredth of a second or faster should get you a sharp result. If you're using a crop sensor, APS-C format uh, camera, a hundred millimeter lens usually becomes 150th or equivalent to 160 of, of uh, sorry, 160 millimeters or 150 millimeters, just depends which brand you're using. Um, that means that you need to use a shutter speed that is at least 150th of a second or faster. And it's to do with the amount of movement in, in that you would capture because you're zoomed in effectively a bit further so a, a, an object can move further across the frame. And similarly with a micro four thirds, camera you may remember that you have a two times focal length magnification factor so a 100 millimeter lens on a micro four thirds camera looks like a 200 millimeter lens on a full frame camera which means you need to use a 200th of a second or faster shutter speed to um, capture a, a sharp subject or a sh sharp scene. Now of course, image stabilization has come along and it might be built into the camera, or it might be built into the lens and that allows you to use slower shutter speeds. So it really extends your ability to hand hold the camera. But let's have a look at the impact. So it compensates for camera shake and enables sharp handheld images at slow, slow shutter speeds. So rather than shooting at hundredth of a second, you might actually be able to shoot at one sixth or a third or something like that. It depends, really. Um, manufacturers quote different compensation factors, and it's worth looking at those. But those figures are kind of measured in labs and it varies uh, by person to person. Uh, you know, some people have a bit more fine tremor than other people. Some people have got a really steady stance and they can hold the camera really nice and steady. Some people are more susceptible to caffeine, for example, than others. I mean, I, I don't drink a great deal of caffeine. And if, so if I have a, a caffeinated coffee, then the chances of me being able to hold a camera steady aren't very high. So, you know, my uh, the compensation factor that I will get from image stabilization drops. So, and as I said, image stabilization, whether it's in body or in camera or uh, sorry, in camera or in lens, or a combination of the two, it can't compensate for a moving subject. So, you know, if you're if the light levels are dropping, you need to use a faster shutter speed. There's no way you, to freeze your subject. You can't, or whatever happens, you, you can't just rely on image, or you can't rely on image stabilization at all for that. So, how do you find your safe shutter speed for hand holding? Well, there's a really easy way to do it actually, and it just takes a little bit of time. So, the first thing to do is to set your camera to shutter priority mode. And you focus on a flat subject, which has got lots of detail. So, it could be something like a fence, wallpaper, or I used to do it by um, you stick a sheet of newspaper on the wall using a blue tack or something like that. And then you photograph it 10 times at what would be what you would consider your safe shutter speed. So we were talking about 100 millimeter lens. If you're on a full frame camera, you'd stick it at a hundredth of a second. Then you would reduce the shutter speed by one stop. So we would take it to a um, 50th of a second um, and you take 10 more shots. And then basically you repeat that until when you're looking at the back of the camera, you can see that all of the images are blurred. And the next thing you want to do is open your images on a computer and look at them in batches of 10 and check if they're sharp 100 at 100 percent on the screen. So, you know, if you look at all of your images that were say that were shot at a tenth of a second, have a look, open them up, open to 100 percent. There should be 10 of them. Go through and look at each one to see if it's sharp. And what you want to do is look at each batch of 10 images and find the ones where you get five that are completely sharp because then you know that if you shoot on average if you shoot two images you should get one that's sharp so if you've got a scene you think well oh, the shutter speed's a bit low but i know i'm okay you can shoot you know shoot two or three images and you should be all right just as a guide and you can do that you can do this test whether you your camera's got stabilization or not it's just a, a you know it's, it's just a neat trick to find out what your safe hand holdable shutter speed is but bear in mind it will vary by lens and by um, focal length so if you've got a zoom lens um, you know theoretically you should do it at every focal length but of course you know after a while you'll get a bit of an idea of what you can do and what you can't do.
Okay, so for your homework, and as I said before, you know, this is purely if you want to do it, I, you know, don't send anything in, I'm not going to mark it, um, but set your camera to shutter priority mode and shoot a moving subject at a range of shutter speeds and check which images look sharp. Um, and you could, you might want to try a couple of different things. Um, it could be, you know, if you've got kids cycling along, photograph them, you've got a dog running around, or it could just be somebody walking. It's really handy to shoot different speed subjects and just see what shutter speed you need to use to freeze them. And if they're running, you know, are there, is their body sharp, but their arms going, pumping away are blurred, maybe their hands are blurred and have a look and just see what sort of shutter speeds freeze, what sort of movement. Also try finding the safe hand holdable shutter speed for your favorite lens. Um, if it's a zoom lens, just pick a focal length that you like to use and then, you know, d d follow the process that I mentioned before and just see what sort of shutter speed you can get down to. Um, it's, it's a really useful exercise that you might find helpful in the future. Okay, so I've got to the end of my presentation. Um, I'll stop sharing my screen and perhaps uh, we can go to some questions. So the first question, because of the sentence, the light that reaches the sensor, I, I understand finally why full frame gets more light. Is it because the sensor is bigger? Am I right? Um, kind of, actually. Um, the point is that, say if you have, if you have a 24 million pixel sensor, uh, you get, um, the, whether it's, if it's full frame, those 24 million pixels, each one can be slightly bigger than if it's on a, an APS-C size sensor, because APS-C format is smaller. So for the same resolution, yes, each pixel gets more light because it's bigger. That's, that's the point. So hopefully that uh, makes it clear. Uh, Pauline says, does the shutter speed work with ICM? So ICM is, for anyone who doesn't know, it's intentional camera movement. And yes, I mean, with that, the panning shot that I had of Otto, that's a type of ICM in a way. I'm intentionally moving the camera to blur the background. It's just I'm trying to move it at the same speed as the dog is moving so that he is sharp. Um, so yes, you know, find your uh, the shutter speed that you like to use for ICM and that might vary by subject depending on how much you know how big it is um, whether you want to include it all in the in the frame and that you know that sort of thing the type of light but I mean some people use ICM at a fifteenth of a second some people might go to um, a whole second it you know, it's I think down to personal experience and preferences we do have a webinar on the on the uh, YouTube channel actually all about ICM. So if you have a look at our YouTube channel, go to YouTube forward slash she clicks, um, you'll see this one about um, ICM. How do you control a focus point with a dog running? In that instance, um, I was actually using, I was shooting that on the Fuji XE4 and I was using the tracking mode and that was working really well actually. So um, Basically, it could use the whole frame, but I could you could start set a starting point. So I started when Otto was standing by my partner, who, watching him to throw the ball, and then as soon as he threw the ball, I see Otto turn around, and the camera did a pretty good job of tracking him um, it, it, with the with the autofocus uh, as long as I could kind of keep up. Alternatively, you could use a mode, say um, perhaps have a small group of autofocus points, and you position it over him. And as he runs, you just keep that point, that active area over him as he runs. Uh, so the next question, when I'm in the woodlands, there are a lot of dogs running. So a wonderful practice opportunities, yes. But the amount of ambient light is a problem. Yes, I think in woodlands, it can be quite problematic. With a thousandth of a second, the F number must be low or the ISO high, yes. That is a problem for me. Mostly dogs come towards me. So with slow shutter speed, the face of dogs seems blurry. Yes, um, this is, you know, it is a problem when you're in a woodland. Although actually this time of year, if you get a sunny day because the trees, the leaves aren't out in the trees yet, you get more light in. Um, but you can push, you know, push the sensitivity up. Um, we'll be talking about sensitivity ISO in the next webinar. It's not a problem per se pushing it up because it's better to push it up and get a sharp image than not. It just depends whether your camera um, is particularly noisy or not or how high you want to push it. Um, 
yeah uh, the other thing was maybe you could ask the owners if they'd like some photographs of the dog and if they would maybe they could go into a local field uh rebecca she would like to ask uh, she took photos one day of a tree outside her window and the leaves and branches were moving beautifully. She wanted to capture this movement. She slowed down her shutter speed to capture the blur, but then the photos were completely blown out with white. She played around with exposure and ISO, but it didn't seem to help. Any ideas? Yes. So um, there, there are limits to how, you, you know, if, if you get too much light in, uh, there comes a point, you know, where the, the aperture can't go small enough. The sensitivity is at its lowest point. Uh, and you, your shutter speed is just a bit too long. Now, maybe you don't need it quite so long. You could experiment, see if you, but if you're not getting the blur you want, the solution is to use a neutral density filter. And a neutral density filter is basically, it looks like a, a gray or black filter and you fit that over the lens and it just cuts down the amount of light that's getting into the lens and therefore into the sensor. And that lets you shoot at either um, you know, longer exposures or using wider apertures than you would be able to normally. Uh, Stephanie says she's missed the first two webinars. Are they still available to view? Yes. If you go to our YouTube channel, uh, say YouTube forward slash she, she clicks, you will find the webinars there. There is actually a, um, a playlist for the basics of photography, but all of the webinars are there and you'll find them. Alternatively, have a look on the website. There's a webinars section and they get put onto there as well. Uh, Gail tried freezing water leaking through the lock gates, shot, uh, shot one image on auto and then one on shutter priority. The one on shutter priority was really dark, much darker than the one on auto. She doesn't know why. Um, well, when you're on auto mode, the camera is taking control of absolutely everything. Whereas when you're on shutter priority mode, you are also in control of, you need to set the, um, you need to set the sensitivity as well. And it might have been that that setting was too low. Um, so I, I imagine that's what the problem was. Also, you know, if you wanted, maybe you needed to increase the um, exposure time in shutter priority modes. So the image wasn't as dark. D has asked me, do I want to say anything about shutter speeds in relation to mirrorless cameras? Well, the, the shutter speeds um, that I've been talking about, it's exactly the same for mirrorless cameras as it is for DSLRs, exactly the same. The, the only thing is that um, electronic, electronic shutters are more prevalent um, in mirrorless cameras, but I only mean that they have them. It's not that you're forced to use it. It's, it's an added feature rather than a, a, a constraint. Um, which usually means that you can shoot at faster shutter speeds. So yeah, everything I've said about shutter speed applies to mirrorless cameras. So hopefully that helps, or, but maybe you had something more specific in mind. Um, oh, good question. Beverly says, should we have the camera on auto ISO for doing the homework or is there a best ISO setting? Um, yeah, it might be easier for this one to set it on auto ISO uh, just to keep everything steady because otherwise what can happen is the image um you know the image will get darker and you just want to focus at this point on shutter speeds <laughs> so pauline says she she's got the wrong hobby because she shakes but thankfully oh that's nice for the explanation um thank you for the explanation she's going to um do what i've suggested about the newspaper on the wall and see what shutter speed she gets so you're very welcome pauline i hope that helps if you find that um you know you, you really struggle then you might want to think about doing something like get a, a monopod it's not so much as the pain as a tripod and you can use it as you know if you're just walking along you can kind of use it as a walking stick if you want or you can stick it in your your bag but it will just get rid of some of that wobble and it's not quite as limiting as a tripod uh right so fiona says if you're taking blurred water in the day how do you adjust for having too much light um yeah, so that's what I was talking about using a, a neutral density filter and they come in different density settings. You might have heard them called big stoppers because leaf filters introduced the first um, sort of neutral density filter that was really quite dark um, and that took out 10 stops of light. So that's a dramatic reduction. And that's when you start using a filter like that, you're pretty much guaranteed that you need to use um, a tripod but you can get ones that take out four stops of light or something like that. So if you need lots of, lots of blurring, look at getting a neutral density filter. Uh, 
Lorraine has asked, when you're panning, do you go in the same direction or against the subject? No, you want to you want to keep the subject in the frame, preferably in the same position. So if you imagine, if you're thinking about the rule of thirds, you've got the subject on a third and you just try and keep it there and you try and keep the focus point on it as it moves. So as it as the subject's moving that way, you move your camera that way. So Inga's asked for some tips on taking photographs of waterfalls. Um, so if you're looking to get blurred shots of you know the, the water coming down, uh, this is a, a time when you probably want to start using uh, a tripod because you may want an exposure of a second or you might want longer, but um, sometimes it's, it's worth doing a few experiments because uh, you keep the sensitivity quite low, set the shutter speed, see what you get and then adjust accordingly. If you want more blur, give set a longer exposure time. If you want less blur, then uh, make a shorter exposure or a faster shutter speed. But don't, it's, it's worth, because you know, there's no rush when you're using a tripod or something like a waterfall, unless you've got people milling all over the place. Because, so, so don't sort of go from one end, it's like the thermostat on your, on your heater, you know, don't go from freezing cold to boiling hot just to adjust in one stop steps so that you can see the impact of blur and you decide how much you want. And it will vary depending on the waterfall because you know the force of the water, um, how deep it is, has an impact. You probably want some sense of movement rather than complete milkiness. Um, so yeah, have a, little, have a little experiment. Joanna's asked if there's any difference when you're using a macro lens or is it the same? Um, well, the, the, the theory is the same, but the thing is with macro, when you get really close, because you're looking at a really small subject, then tiny, tiny movements become quite important. So that's when you can't really rely on the hand holding thing. You probably want to push the shutter speed up even further or use a tripod. And a tripod is generally the best approach for, for macro photography. Also with macro photography, it's not just the kind of general wobble that you get, that any kind of front to back movement obviously has a massive impact as well, because you know you put the focus in exactly the point you want on, on the flower or the insect or whatever it is you're focusing on. If you then move forward or backwards, you're affecting where that focus point is. And you know, with a with a landscape, a little bit of movement doesn't make much difference at all, but obviously it does with a um, with a macro. Um, macro image. So I would suggest that use the shutter speed by all means to control the, the light, but usually uh, macro photography is much more about the aperture that you choose than the shutter speed. Okay, so Pauline says she's having a problem judging the sharpness of an image. Oh yes, I mean that, that can be a problem because you know if you've got th these are very focal and you kind of well they're, they're very slightly very focal um, and if you move your head you get a different uh, view but uh, yeah I think maybe switch to some glasses that aren't very focal I would say but it, the most important point is it's when you're looking on the you know go through all the process uh, to, and have a develop a good technique for your camera and then when you're looking at your computer be able to see whether you've got the right results or not um it's this is why you need to develop an understanding of what shutter speed will work for you because then you know okay well if i always shoot everything at 125th then generally you know with my favorite lens then i'm okay um if you sort of think oh, it's a bit iffy when i go to a 60th or a 30th either know that you need to double up on your, you know, take double shots. So you've always got one that's sharp or, you know, just bear in mind that you need to take extra, you'd be extra careful to, to stand, you know, really still or start using some support, lean on a wall, um, lean the camera against a wall, use a monopod or a, sh or a tripod or something. What shutter speed we use to keep a duck or goose in sharp focus, but wings blurred. If it's on the water, uh, Crikey. I mean, Mike's kind of like a, go, a good safe go to shutter speed is kind of like 125th or something like that or 250th. I mean, th like the shots with Otto that you saw, he kind of looked OK at 250 or 125. So maybe try those because I mean, when if, you, if they're on the water, they do flap their wings quite fast when they're, you know, um, I don't know what they're doing, grooming or something. Um, if it's in the air flying towards you, 
then you need to start using a you know, much faster shutter speed. And that's when you're sort of talking about a thousandth or two thousandth of a second to freeze it. And then you kind of knock it back just a little bit to get a little bit of blur in, in the movement. But it also depends which way it's moving. Because as you saw with the panning image, Otto's head was razor sharp. And that's just because I managed to catch him while well, his head wasn't bobbing up and down. And it was the camera was moving at the right speed to freeze him. Whereas, you know, his legs, which were going like Billio, sorry about that, his legs um, are blurred. Uh, what if you're shooting in manual? If you're shooting in manual exposure mode, um, you control shutter speed in exactly the same way. Um, you know, you take into account, you would use exactly the same shutter, um, shutter speed settings, but you need to look at the, the markings. You know, I um, I've spoken about this on a previous webinar where there's uh, there's a marker point which shows whether the image is going to be over or underexposed or correctly exposed. You need to make sure that you're getting the correct um, exposure. That marker needs to be in the middle, assuming that the scene is kind of like the, an average brightness. If um, you know, if you start increasing the changing the shutter speed, then you need to adjust either the sensitivity or the um, aperture to compensate. And if you're shooting in shutter priority, then the camera does some of that for you. So shooting in manual, you just have to do some of the work, the extra work that the camera normally does. Um, so we've come to the end of the question. So thank you everybody who came along tonight. It's been lovely to have you all here. Um, the next webinar, as I say, in this series will be about sensitivity or ISO. Bye bye.